Um, so, okay, I'll introduce uh, Chot Reyes, a uh, five-time winner of the Coach of the Year Award with uh, the Philip, uh, PBA, eight, to eight PBA championships he has. Uh, he currently, he's uh, obviously head of the, the Philippine national team. Um, and they will have a monumental uh, situation in the next uh, few months, or well, starting in, in August, I, I understand. The um, FIBA uh, uh, championships, this is the Asia version, so uh, Chot will be under a lot of pressure to have a win, and I understand he has to win in, among the top three in order to qualify for the, the world uh, championships in, in Spain. But the Asia group covers all of Middle East and, and a huge, it seems like it's more like half the world or, or something is, is, is the group. So they're, you know, they have to, the challengers are countries like China, Iran, where they grow big giant guys and all, all these other, Lebanon and so forth. So it's not an easy uh, situation. And, and uh, you know, we'll be interested to hear, I know we're supposed to talk about business uh, a lot or more, but but you know you can't help talk a little bit about basketball too. So uh, we'll do that. Okay. So yeah. So sports coach, his training at both a, as a sports coach and, and, and a business coach, and I think he's a bit unique that his business background. He comes from a, a business background. He started his career in in business and then went back to to sport. He didn't come up the usual, you know player, 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 coach kind of a thing. He's, he comes from a business background and has tremendous business, business coaching um, training and experience both here and, and throughout out the, the world, I noticed. His list of, of trainings is almost half a page for just the, the business side and then a similar size for the, the sports side. He's worked with many of the, uh, you know, the, the great sports teams in, in th throughout the world. So. Um, yeah, also winner of the William Jones Cup title in, in Taipei. Um, beat uh, the, the final was uh, against a, uh, a very advanced uh, U.S. team, which uh, the Philippine group uh, um, beat. Just last February, Chad again created history, being the first te uh, tw team in 27 years to win the prestigious PBA All-Filipino Championship two years in, in a row. So. Okay, well, I, I got a list of other things I'm supposed to say. I'm supposed to say that he's executive director of the MVP Sports Foundation, which is a very key organization here. Um, also head of sports for TV5. Um, he's a sports uh, business instructor at Ateneo uh, University, many of you know. Um, a licensed John Maxwell uh, building teams workshop facilitator. So, have I gone on long enough? <laughs> So please welcome a big hand for Chot Reyes to the stage. Good morning, everybody. Uh, nice, uh, up and nice and bright, shiny. It's really a pleasure for me to be uh, before all of you. Um, I just like to say that I. I, I got to read the emailer uh, Richard and the invitation Richard sent around and I wanted to say thank you for the pressure by saying that if we don't deliver in August and lead the Philippines to the world championships what did you say my neck is gonna get sliced off so thanks for the pressure but um, I'm here to share with you my experiences uh, I from a lifetime of coaching basketball coaching and later on different kind of coaching I I, I'm not a business expert or management guru by any stretch of the imagination. All I am is a basketball coach. And what I do is just share my stories. I'm going to share my experiences from a lifetime of coaching. Uh, we're going to show you some video, take you behind the scenes to our basketball practices. And hopefully, in the process, figure out and find the applications between what I do and what you do. And then at the end, we're going to uh, open it up to some questions, and I know some of you have basketball questions, some of you have business questions, some of you may have chismis questions. We'll try to answer them as as as, as well as I can. But to start with, um, I'd like to I'd like to play this first first video to be very uh, faithful to our methodology. Uh, I teach a class at the Ateneo, as Richard mentioned. I teach a class in sports business. One of my students, Miko 
Baranda is here. Yes, Miko, uh, from way back. Don't remind me what year, Miko. But uh, what I noticed when I, when, when I teach is the minute I start lecturing, my students start sleeping. So uh, uh, I, I hate lecturing. What I do is just I, I tell stories, I share my experiences, and we watch a lot of video. So true, true to my methodology, I'd like to start off by playing uh, this very short video. Can you now help me? Because I might mess it up. <laughs> volume. Here's the thing that makes life so interesting. The theory of evolution claims only the strong shall survive. Maybe so. Maybe so. But the theory of competition says just because they're the strong doesn't mean they can't get their asses kicked. That's right. See, what every long shot come from behind underdog will tell you is this. The other guy may in fact be the favorite. The odds may be stacked against you, fair enough. But what the odds don't know is this isn't a math test. This is a completely different kind of test. One where passion has a funny way of trumping logic. So before you step up to the starting line, before the whistle blows and the clock starts ticking. Just remember out here, the results don't always add up. No matter what the stats may say, and the experts may think, and the commentators may have predicted, when the race is on, all bets are off. Don't be surprised if somebody decides to flip the script and take a pass on yelling uncle. And then suddenly, as the old saying goes, we got ourselves a game. Some of you in this room this morning, you can leave it there, Richard. Yeah, some of you in this room this morning can, I'd prefer we got ourselves a game than that picture. <laughs> Let's play it again. Yeah. Um, some of you in this room this morning may be the dominant player in your industry. Some of you may be the challenger. Some of you may be on the way to controlling and, and dominating your business. But the reason I wanted to play that video is a couple of things. Number one, to remind everyone that we're in competition. We're in competition. And that, in my mind, really, it's a game. Granted, it's a game where the stakes are higher. It's not just winning a game or losing a game. It's a game where business is on the line. A lot of times, lives are at stake when you make money or you don't make money. But the thing I liked about that video is it reminds us that in this competition, it's a competition which isn't a math test. Sometimes it's not, it doesn't go, the victory doesn't only go to the strongest, to the fittest, to the one who has the most resources. Because passion, character, attitude, they all play an important part in winning the game. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, this, after, this, this morning. It's really how to win in this game. And... Uh, all I'm going to do is I'm going to work from, a, from, I'm going to start from a framework of building championship teams because that's what I know to do best and that's what uh, I have uh, direct experience with. And obviously when you build teams, the most important thing is to first pick the right players. Pick the right players. And I know we are all, you are all experts in picking out the talent and the people that you need to be on your team. But let me just offer some other thoughts than just mere talent or skill or technical expertise. O obviously, we all want to hire or get into our teams the best possible talent, the most, the most skilled that we can find. But while talent is a given, let's not forget a couple of things. Number one, 
hire for attitude hire not only for talent but hire for what we call in sports i love calling it hire for hustle my belief is that hustle is a talent the ability to work hard the ability to roll up your sleeves and spend hours and and, and even lose sleep deprive yourself of sleep that's a talent so in your interviewing process, when you talk to people, look for the people who you think are willing to work hard, have the capacity to work hard. In sports, we call that talent. We say teammanship. We, can, we cannot overlook and underestimate the value of teammanship, how important it is to hire people who are great teammates. That's number one. Number two, I would also like to say that the best players don't, always make the best team if you if you're familiar with sports and you're familiar with the history of Olympic basketball in 2004 they put together what many called the strongest the best US team ever they had uh, Carmelo Anthony Dwayne Wade LeBron James Dwight Howard all these super names and they said this is the best team this is the best talent in the entire universe and that this team this team cannot lose well, into 2004 Olympics, that super team bare, didn't make the finals, barely won the bronze medal. The best talent doesn't necessarily make the best team. In fact, uh, what, what uh, the Team U.S. found out later on is, what Team U.S. found out later on is that just having the best players on the floor doesn't guarantee a gold medal. They were beaten by Argentina. In 2004, Argentina won the gold medal in soccer, which we all expect, but they also won the gold medal in basketball. So I went to Buenos Aires and I visited and I figured, I tried to find out what's going on. What's going on in Buenos Aires? What are they doing different for a team like Argentina to beat the mighty US and win the Olympic gold medal? When I got there, there was nothing special. They had no super facilities, they didn't have a secret training regimen, nothing. But what I found is the Argentine team that beat the U.S., Manu Ginobili, Scola, uh, all these guys, they were together since they were 16 years old, 17 years old. And they were now 25, 26 year, 26 year olds beating Team USA. What was the learning for me? Obviously staying together, forming a bond, the chemistry is important, but by looking at the Argentine national team, it drove me my third point in looking for, in hiring the people in your team. That is the value of what I call the go-through guy. Again, this is, this is my, just my own personal invention. I, it's, I don't think you can find it in, uh, in books or, what, or, or any kind of liter literature, but what I find is in sports, that is the go-to guy. The guys who love sports, who are familiar, who watch, you know the go-to guy is the MVP. You know, the Lakers, they need a big basket, they go to Kobe Bryant. The ultimate go-to guy is Michael Jordan. Every time the Chicago Bulls needed a big a, a point, uh, a big play, they go to Michael Jordan. In my team, in Token Text, go-to guy, Jimmy Alapag. We want to get something done. So go-to guy is important. He's the superstar. He's your top producer, he's your top IT expert, he's your whatever, he's your MVP. But see, in, in, as we celebrate and take a look at the go-to guys, we forget the value of the go-through guys. Who are the go-through guys? The go-through guys are the individuals without whose efforts the go-to guy cannot get their job done. So in a sales organization, the go-to guy is the sales superstar. The go-through guy, go guy might be the telephone operator, the order taker, the guy driving the van to deliver the goods. The people without whose efforts, the go-to guy cannot get the job done. So what is my learning? What I found in the Argentine team, the go-through guys are the guys who are willing to do the dirty work. The guys who are go willing to do the behind-the-scenes work. Their names are not going to come out in the papers the next day because they don't score the most points. They don't, they're not the heroes. But teams cannot win without go-through guys. And my learning is to be a champion team, you have to have go-to guys, you have to have go-through guys. 
We also call it glue guys. It's a sports terminology. What the go-through guy, we call them the glue guys. They're the guys who keep the team together. So my learning is, in a team, you have to have a go-to guy. You have to have go-through guys. But in a championship team, to be a champion team, your go-to guys must be willing to do the job of go-through guys. So they kept that 2004 U.S. team together. And then they started to understand each other. And then now Kobe Bryant comes in. And he says, I'm the leading scorer in the NBA. But coach, who's the best scorer in the other team? I got him. He's not going to score. I'll play defense, the dirty work. I don't care if I score a point. When your go-to guys are willing to do the job of the go-through guys, when your go-to guys are willing to be sometimes subjugate themselves and step back a little bit from the limelight and be a go-through guy and have other people step in and do the work, that's what makes championship teams. So when we build great teams, we want to look for, we want to hire for hustle. We, want, we know that the best players don't necessarily make the best team. But most importantly, let us not overlook the value of the go-through individuals. Dear friends in this room, Think of the go-through individuals in your organization. Who are the people without whose efforts you cannot get your job done? In all probability, everyone in this room is a go-to guy. You're all the go-to guys in your organization. But think about the go-through guys in, in, in your team, in your business unit. Celebrate them, reward them, recognize them. Secondly, don't be afraid, even if you're a go-to guy, to do the job of a go-through individual. Sometimes we need to do the dirty work. Sometimes we need to take a step back. That's what, make champ that's what makes championship teams. And that's what Team USA learned from the 2004 experience. When they wouldn't win, they barely got the bronze medal. That's what they learned. They kept the team together. They won in 2008. They won again in 2012. Mark my words, that team, if they keep that team together, is not going to lose another game as long as they keep that group together. Why? Because they got the magic formula. They got the best players in the world willing to do the dirty work, willing to do the little things. Those are the types of people we want on our team. Those are the types of people we want on our team. Now, having said that, I know some of you will say, well, coach, that's fine because as a basketball coach, you can go out and pick your players. But in business, or in the office, or in corporate life, sometimes we have no choice. Sometimes we come here, these are the people that we have to work with already. And you know, sometimes I can't, I can't uh, stomach one guy or another, but hey, I have to work with him. So how do we build? How do we build great teams? After having spoken to you about, in my mind, the kind of players we want to have on our team, I want to just share my thoughts now on actually how to build the team. Now you got the players you want, or maybe you don't have the players that you want. Maybe you don't have the perfect team, the, per the perfect group of players in your hand. What is the first thing that we do and what I've learned throughout, and I'm going to use the acronym of TEAM, T-E-A-M. I'm going to talk to you about building trust, about being committed to execution, about being accountable, and a very Jesuit term, it's a Latin term called magis, which is Latin for more. So how do we build teams? Trust, execution, accountability, magis. Okay, what do I mean? I think the most important thing and the foundation, John Maxwell says the foundation of, of all teamwork is trust. If you want to build teams as a leader, we've got to take the lead in building trust levels in our organization. What does it mean? As a leader, we must not be afraid to be vulnerable to our people. Again, as leaders, we should not be afraid to be vulnerable to people. It's vulnerability-based trust. It is when we say to our team, I am your boss, I am your leader, but I've, I don't have all the answers and I need your help. Nothing kills trust quicker than the Superman theory of leadership, which says, I am the boss, I am the leader, I have all the answers, this is what we will do, this is how we should do it. The reason why I continue to teach college kids today at the Ateneo is because I want to understand how they think. 
I want to understand what's their thought process going to work because my executive clients, they always come to me and say, Coach, my problem is the new hires we have, the kids fresh from college, you can't talk to them. You know, there's, there's a communication gap. They, you know, they, we, we just can't communicate with those college kids. And that's right. Because the college kids today, I don't know if you have the same experience, but the college kids today, they hate being told what to do. They hate being told what to do. They're talented, they're dynamic, they're, they're, they can do a lot of things, but don't tell them what to do. But they want to be led, they want to be motivated, they want to be inspired. That's our challenge as leaders. So, if you're a leader that says, well, and you're going and operating with the old, um, the old uh, style of leadership, where you see with the management style, where you say, you know, I have the most, taking it from the military, I have the most stripes, I am the boss, I'm the leader, you have the loudest voice, then it's not gonna work with today's generation of fresh graduates. They hate being told what to do. What they're looking for is leaders they can trust. What they're looking for is leaders who are, I don't know if you remember the Piolo Pascual commercial with Sprite, di ba? Sabi sa Sprite kay Piolo Pascual, magpakatotoo ka. So bosses, mga leaders, I'm sorry to the others for, for speaking in Tagalog, pero mga boss, magpakatotoo tayo. That's the essence of vulnerability based trust. How do you build teams? You start with building trust levels with your people. Think about it. How do you coach an individual? Same first step. Build <coughs> trust levels. You cannot coach somebody without that foundation of trust. Trust enables you to create relationships. And I love the PLDT. This is, this is plugging for PLDT relationships first. But I like to add on to that relationships first phrase. What I learned is, I mean, we're all familiar with all the financial metrics in our business. ROI, ROA, ROS, ROE, return on equity, return on investment. Let me just introduce another R, an ROR, a return on relationship. And really, when we build strong relationships with our people, the return is fantastic. It's, it's, it's quantum return. And if you build great relationships with your people, you're modeling to them how important it is to build great relationships with their people, with public, with clients, with the people they work with. But the starting point of all that relationship is trust. And speaking of which, uh, I remember it, this was November of 2000, what's 2013, 2011, no 2000, yeah, 2011, I was at home watching film and my phone rings and I take a look at my phone it's Ali Peak I don't know if, if you're a basketball fan you you know who Ali Peak is Ali Peak was calling so I f answered my phone and I said hey Ali what's up Ali Peak was on the line he was frantic hey coach I've been shot man I've been shot what I said what are you saying coach somebody shot me I don't want to die coach I'm bleeding to death help me you gotta help me I said, calm down, Ali, calm down. What's going on? Apparently, somebody really shot him. He's on, in his car. The, our trainer was driving him to the Makati Medical City Hospital. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? He said, call my, call my Lola, call my, uh, call my Lola in, in Cubao, call my dad in California, and tell them this. And uh, Okay, I got it. I got it, Ali. I'll take care of it, okay? So we went there. We went to Medical City. Ali Peak was there. He was basically bleed, bleeding to death. He was going into his car, the back seat. Somebody steps right behind him and shoots him from close range. This, this close, fires a shot, hits him, and it, it landed, it ended up within a millimeter of his carotid artery. It was large deer. Very, very lucky. But because he was brought there early, they were able to stop the bleeding. In other words, he, he survived that, that gunshot attack. But basically, his basketball career was over. So the doctor said, you know, we are not going to take that bullet away because doing so would entail more danger. It's too risky to get in through all those nerves and everything. We're going to keep the bullet in, and uh, we'll see fibrous tissue would grow around it, and hopefully you can live, live a, a, a normal life after. So he was basically done with basketball. He went back home to the States, 
to, to, to rest and, and recuperate and all that. But we, in our team, we thought that that was it. Ali Peak was done in his basketball career. Couple of months in the U.S., he gets restless, starts working out, and he calls me. He says, Coach, I want to come back. And we were right into the semifinals. It was a best of seven affair. We were playing a strong team, Petron, and we were down three games to one. I mean, we were dead and buried. It was over. No team comes back from a 3 1 deficit. Ali P comes in, he starts the game, we play him, plays very little, inspires the team no end so that we win that game to go down 3 2. And then we win the next game to make it 3 3. And then it's now game seven for the chance to get to the final. Everything on the line. One minute left. Danny Ildefonso. Guys, I don't know if you know, I'm sure you know Danny Ildefonso of Petron. Hasn't missed a shot the whole game. Gets wide open in the baseline. We were up by one point. Danny Ildefonso rises up for the game winner. And out of nowhere, Ali Peak jumps up, blocks the shot, misses. Game over. Token text goes to the championship we win the series 40 that was like just the third team in 35 years to come back from a 3-1 deficit what a great story about Ali Peak but what a better story about return on relationship I invited him to one of my uh, talks a couple of months back and he talked about that incident for the first time and somebody in the audience asked him so Ali of all the people, when you got shot, why did you call your coach? Why not your, your, your dad or your Lola or your best friend? And Ali Peak said, because I knew my coach. I trusted him. I knew he'd do the right thing. What a great testament to our influence and our impact on our people. Here is a player in a real, not, not figurative, in a real, literal, life or death situation. And who does he call? First person in his mind, his coach. Ladies and gentlemen, we wield a tremendous amount of influence over our people, whether we know it or not, whether we like it or not. And, and the, the starting point of that is our ability to forge great relationships. Because with great relationships, then there is a great return. When we forge great relationships with our people, they're willing to do so much for you. Not because of your position, not because of our title, especially the younger generation today, our title, our position, our past achievements, they don't care. That doesn't awe them, that doesn't excite them. Our job as CEOs, as managers, as leaders, is to develop that one-on-one -on -one relationship with our people. And the starting point of all that is vulnerability-based trust. Trust. Next is execution. I would suggest to build great teams, coach your people on the four disciplines of execution. And I get that question all the time. I get people asking me, Coach, we, we just came from a nice vision mission exercise. We came from a great planning activity out in Boracay or whatever. And you know, our, our, our mission, our goals and everything are so well written. It's in our boardroom. It's nice and sexy to look at. But coach, we can't execute. You got nice plans, but we got no execution. So people keep asking me about programs for execution. And my belief in, in, in 20 years of coaching in the PBA, I've been coaching for 30 years, including my time coaching at Ineo, but in the PBA 20 years, is that there is no magic or there's no shortcut to execution. But what I have learned is execution is a function of attitude, basics, core conditioning, and drill. What I call the fundamentals or the ABCDs of execution. Attitude, basics, core conditioning, drill. If there is something that needs to be done, if you're faced with a big target, a huge project, the first step is all, always attitude. If your attitude is, well, that's too difficult, we can't do it, then forget it. There is no execution possible when people from the start say that we can't do it. So the starting point of getting anything done is for everyone to have a can-do attitude, to have a winner's attitude and say, well, that's, e that's difficult, that's such a stretch target, I don't know if we'll, we can do it, but we're gonna find a way. 
I think the starting point for any kind of execution on a big scale or even in a smaller scale is your attitude. And again, ladies and gentlemen, dear fellow leaders in this room, we drive that attitude. We drive that attitude. Our attitude is really, the, the, the attitude of our people really depends on our own attitude. They feed off our energy. So the starting point is a, is a can-do attitude. Next, be not only good, don't be just proficient, but I like to call it be absolutely brilliant at the basics. Think about your line of work, whether you're in the outsourcing industry, in the BPO, or in, in, in finance, in accounting, whatever. What are the fundamentals? What are the basics? And I would suggest you go back to that and be brilliant at the basics. Now, what do I mean? Can you help me again, Richard, in the next video? I'll take you behind the scenes now to our actual basketball practices when I talk about uh, the value of being absolutely brilliant at the basics. Just the next video, yeah, that one, yeah. This is, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the video is kind of, uh, the videos that I show are homemade videos, so they're not glitzy, nice productions. Those are just videos from my personal uh, collection, so they're kind of, they're kind of grainy, they're homemade, uh, but I think it will suffice. This is when I was coaching San Miguel in 2007. I came in, and San Miguel, when I came in, was dead last in the PBA in fast break points, which means they were the slowest team in the league. So my number one priority coming into San Miguel was to improve our speed. We need to be go from a slow team to a fast team. So I thought to myself, we want to run fast, the fundamental question is, do we know how to run? So this is our actual first day of practice. And this is a basketball team. The, pe the, the players are garbed in their basketball attire, basketball shoes. But what is our lesson? First day of work, no ball, no shooting. We are teaching our players how to run. Okay, so these are, f these are superstars. This guy who's very dark here, the, the extreme left, you can hardly see him because he's really dark. That's Dorian Pena. And then that's Danny Siegel is there, Danny Ildefonso is there, Romel Aducul. Towards the rightmost part is Don Don Ontiveros, L8 Honor. These are superstars. These are established names in the PBA. And in our first day of practice, we thought we were teaching them how to run. And they were looking around and they were saying, our coach is crazy. You know, we're in a basketball team. We're not, we didn't sign up for track and field. But my point was, you want to run fast, you best know how to run. So here we're just working on the biomechanics of running, about lifting your knees high in line with, with, with the swinging of your arms and being in balance as you do so. Can you play the video, please? So just very basic things. After that, here we're working on our footwork. Now this is my talk and text team at the Moro Lorenzo in Ateneo. Just improving the quickness of our feet. That's Jimmy Alabagja. That's Ali Peak, the third guy here on the left. Big body, that's Ali Peak. Okay. Pause it, please, Richard. Yeah. Sorry, thank you for... Pleasure. Yeah. Um, the biomechanics of running, footwork. I mean, I work with a lot of sales organizations, and I ask them, what is the application of footwork to your line of work in a sales, in a sales environment? So many applications of footwork you know, pounding the pavement, ability to walk the extra mile for the client, prospecting, there's so many applications of footwork. And in basketball, these are our fundamentals, these are our basics. And when, when we go through that, we want to make sure we're not only good at it, but we're absolutely brilliant at the basics, because that's very, very important. Think about it for a minute. In your line of work, what are the basics? before even thinking of, like when, when we work with sales uh, people, we tell them, you know, even before thinking of product knowledge, how to present, how to close sales, what about the value of breathing? And they look at me and say, breathing? Well, my thinking as a basketball coach is, you can only be a good shooter if you're a relaxed shooter. Only relaxed shooters are good shooters. How can you relax? Check your breathing. You see, we were all, we're a pretty young group here, audience here. 
we were all uh, raised in the Jaworski. We, we all know how Jaworski takes the free throw. He's got a couple of dribbles and he'll inhale, expand his chest. Remember Jaworski before he shoots? That's the wrong way to breathe. <laughs> Try it. If you, ex if you inhale and expand your chest, you will find that your heart rate quickens. It increases. So with a fast heart rate, how can your pulse be relaxed enough to shoot? The right way to breathe, and we actually do this with sales organizations, is we have them take their right palm, you can do it if you want in your seats, put it just on top of their stomach, and when you inhale, it should, it should raise up, it should rise up. So inhale, exhale. So that's the right, if you do that for one minute, I guarantee you will feel lightheaded. Why? Because our bodies are not used to the proper intake of oxygen. We really, for some reason, have forgotten the right way to breathe. So what do I tell the sales, most of them uh, medical med reps for pharma companies? And we say, when you're outside the office of the doctor waiting, every doctor makes them wait, it doesn't matter who. Instead of playing Candy Crush or texting or doing whatever, why don't you do your breathing exercises? Breathing exercises that's going to relax you, that's going to center you, that's going to make you prepared to deliver the best pitch, the best spill. Research shows that when people are unable to close sales, it's not because they have no knowledge, they don't have enough product knowledge. It's not because they have poor presentation skills, it's because they were so tense, they were so nervous, they forgot what they had to say. Or they were so tense that they transmitted that tension to the doctor and the doctor ended up not buying or whatever, not ordering from them. So that's what I mean. It's a very basic, 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 just breathing. Because relaxed shooters are good shooters. And I would, I would bet in your line of work, relaxed whatever. Relaxed accountants are good accountants. Relaxed, relaxed telephone operators are good telephone. If not too relaxed that they fall asleep, obviously. <laughs> but, but that's what I mean by, the, by a fundamental. And we actually do this in my teams. In our teams, before every practice, we go to our room our, in, our, in our practice facility and we do breathing exercises and I learned this from Phil Jackson when he started off with Michael Jordan and obviously when they were doing it first with the Chicago Bulls Michael Jordan was doing it with his one of his eyes open he was really taking a look if people were doing it but when they bought into it the Bulls never lost they understood the value of, of, of how important breathing is so that's a basic that 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 is just an example of what the basics are more than the technical skills so figure out and think about your line of work and what are the real basics. So attitude, basics. Next is core conditioning. You see in sports, all of our power comes from our, from our core muscles, from our core. This is, this is our core, our uh, abs, our lower abs, our obliques, and our back muscles. The, the, all of these muscles comprise our core. And all our strength, our ability to move quickly, to jump high, to, to run fast, Everything comes from our core. Whether you're, you're in golf, or you're, you're playing badminton, or you're running, or you're cycling, whatever sport you're in, all of your power comes from your core. So in our line of work, we are obsessed with core conditioning, strengthening our core. Here's an example. Please. That's what we use for our lower back. That's for the lower ab abdominal muscles. Actual footage. One minute right leg up, then one minute left leg. And then we go to our side planks. That's for our obliques. Side, one minute left side, one minute right side. And come around to the second set. After doing that, then here, then this is Jimmy Alapag. Now we tell him when you jump, going down and up, the way you do that, it's not your legs, it's your core. So you tell them when you do that, activate your core. Activate your core. When you jump down and quick get up, we always tell our players to activate their core. Even when they're lifting weights, here's Jason Castro. 
When he's lifting, that's not all legs or, or arms. That's core. We're training our players to activate our core. Pause, please, Richard. Why do I talk to you about core conditioning when I talk about execution and in our line of work? Two dimensions. Number one, I think for any one of us to be consistently good at what we do, we have to be in some kind of physical shape. I mean, not elite athlete shape like those guys, but you know, just have eat the right way, get enough sleep, have a modicum amount of exercise to just be in, in some kind of shape. But secondly, more importantly, I think to consistently do well in our work, to consistently be a top uh, executor, to be able to execute at the highest levels, it's very important for every one of us to just go back and think about at its very core, what is it we do? What is the core of our job? Sa Tagalog, ang ganda ng Tagalog term natin dun eh. Sa kaibuturan ng ating trabaho, ano ba yung ating ginagawa? At bakit? Ladies and gentlemen, if we haven't done it in quite a while, I think today is a good a time as any to think about it. It's, uh, what is it? It's 8.45, April 16, 2013. Right where you're seated to think about what is the core of my work? Why do I do this? Why do I put up with this pressure, with all this hassle, with all this sakit ng ulo? What is the reason for us being here? Some of you will say, I, I need to make a living for my family. Some of you will say, you know, I got, uh, still have siblings that I need to get through college, help my parents. Some of you may have parents in wherever, overseas, you want to get them back here. Some of you may want to leave a legacy. Some of you may think about, you know, what is it after this? Now is a good a time as any to think about the core of our work. Because what I find is when the going gets tough, when we're down 20 points and there's 10 minutes left and we've really been given up for loss, or when we're down three games to one and everybody's congratulating the other team, yung tinatawag natin sa Tagalog, meron tayong pinaghuhugutan. Alam niyo yun? That's the core. Yun yung kaibuturan. What I just said is, in, in, there's a Tagalog term for it and we say, when there's when people say you gotta find that something deep inside, you gotta find that something deep inside, you know what they're referring to? That's the core. Strengthen it, reinforce it, understand the core of why you're doing things. Then, when push comes to shove, when things really get tough, then you can activate your core. In the same manner, we will tell Jimmy Lapag when he does that, does that jumping exercise, activate your core. Or Jason Castro lifting 200 pounds and he's 160, dripping wet, to be able to lift 200, 220 pounds, activate your core. Attitude, basics, core conditioning. That's what allows us to get things done. And finally, letter D is drill. Drill, drill, drill. Practice, practice, practice. Our challenge as executives, as CEOs, as leaders in our organization is to find practice fields in our daily routine. We need to find practice fields. Here is an example. Again, going back to our one of our drills in, in our team. Play piece. I'd like to call your attention here. You just be ready to pause when I say it. Yeah. Uh, at the topmost uh, side, on the right side, that's Rane Del Del Campo. He passes, he catches, pause please, pause. There. Take a look at where he takes the shot. That's the left side of the free throw line. Rane Del Del Campo, he caught the ball, he took one dribble, and he shot it at the left. He caught the ball at the, on top of the three-point line, took one dribble, shot it at that left side of the free throw line. Play it, please. And he's going to make that. Swap, nothing but net. It's going to come up again in a couple of seconds. This is boring. This is repetitive. It's hot. There's no air conditioning. But this is our practice. Here's Renadel again. He ca he'll catch it. He'll both pause it. There. Same thing. Same exact action. Catches. 
One dribble, jump shot, same spot. He's going to make that shot again. Okay, that's the drill. And please remember where he took and made that shot. If he, he, he does that over and over again. So what did I say? How do you execute? Attitude, basics, conditioning, drill. The four disciplines of execution. You take care of all those things. The byproduct is execution. Now I take you from a practice, from a practice where nobody's watching to an actual game where there's 20,000 people watching at the Arneta. Continue playing, please. And just be ready to pause when I start the play here. Two seconds pause, please. For the here now from the practice facility, here's an actual game. Araneta Coliseum, if you can see the time, there's 2.1 seconds left. There's 2.1 seconds left. My team, Token Text, is down by one point to Air 21. Okay? This is the game in 2008, all Filipino, that we needed to win to get into our first finals as, as a coach of Token Text. So big game, okay? Uh, TV lights, everything is there. Okay, and then what did they say? How do you execute? Attitude, basics, conditioning, drill. The byproduct is execution. Play it, please. Game winner, Naradil, for the win. Yes, sir! Pass it, please. Where did he make the shot? Exact same spot he practiced. If he's made that shot a, th a, a thousand, he's made it once, he's made it a thousand times. There is no secret to execution basics conditioning drill we play it again merry christmas Ronaldo del campo it's a great shot nonetheless and we'll see, see. if it counts Pause it, please. this is a great lesson for us leaders we have i hope my we have one of our best shooters this is Rendon nitualo from here i made him curl to the other side and this guy our go-to guy is jimmy lapag from here i made him go to that corner and the guy down there that's the leading scorer in the P-Bay at the time was Mac Cardona. We made him flash across the lane. What did I do? I emptied this place. I emptied this spot for Rani Del de Ocampo. But, you see, in the papers the next day, the hero is Rani Del de Ocampo, the go-to guy. Made the last shot. Nobody's going to mention what Jimmy Lapag did as a go-to guy, being a go-through guy, sacrificing, going away. Grendo Nitualo going away. Jason Castro making that pass. These are the, the, the little things that go behind the scene toward execution. But the, bigger, but the bigger lesson in my mind here is when I move my players around, leaders, that is what we do. You see, our job is not to take the last shot. Our job is to put our people in the perfect position to make the shot. That's our job. It is not our job. I'm a very good shooter myself. <clears throat> but no matter how good a shooter I am, that's not my job. My job is to make sure my people are in the proper places to hit the shot. Play, please continue. So shooters out and now we talked about footwork. Are being if Rani Del de Ocampo didn't have great footwork, he wouldn't get the shot open. off. So he catches, over JR Kenyatta, one two, JR Kenyatta one step, out, jump shot. Releases that ball with enough time. Nico, we talked about trading a player and hoping that that player doesn't hurt you. Rani Del Same Ocampo, thing here. Just put See? the hurt thing footwork. on footwork. Everyone is focusing on the shot. Every we gotta understand the value of footwork winner. to get that and shot that out. It gets even better when you hit that game winner on Christmas Day for your new team. And Rani Del just made it happen. One dribble, one, dribble, one, one shot. shot for the win. Yes, sir. Pause, please. So there is no secret to execution. There is no sexy sauce. There is no magic formula to execution. Finally, I do know, though, that execution is a function of attitude, basics, core conditioning, and drill. In my mind, the four disciplines of execution. If you pay attention to those things, then you can execute. Then execution follows. So I talked to you about trust, about execution. Letter A in team for me is about accountability. Very funny. Um, I've been coaching for quite a while in the PBA and I've won by that time 
two, four or five championships. And my current boss, Mr. Pangilinan, MVP, we've always known each other from Ateneo, from so on. We've, we've always had a good relationship. But even if I was winning all those championships and his team was, act, was li literally sucking it up, Diba, Risa, for a long time, talk and text, highest paid team, had the best players, they couldn't win. In 10 years in the PBA, they had won a grand total of one championship. And you know why they won? Because that was the year the Philippine, the national team players were pulled out of their mother team. So they had, they won over a very weak field. So, but what I was trying to say is, when I was winning all these championships, Mr. Pangalinan would never get me. There was talk. They were talking to me a little bit that they wouldn't get me as, a, as their coach, as the talk and text coach. So it's fine. So in 2007, I got my first stint as a national team coach. And my job was if we won the Philippine, the Asian Championships, we'd be the first team to play in the Olympics in 36 years. That was 2007. We prepared, we had a lot of problems, but we did our best. And I thought we gave it a really, really good try in Japan, but we failed. And we failed miserably. It wasn't even close. And my wife is here. She can attest. We, we have friends. We have a very good friend who has an apartment in Tokyo. And so when we lost, we seriously contemplated staying in Tokyo and not coming back here. Because I would be crucified by media. Because here was this huge buildup. And here was this coach supposed to lead the Philippines to the promised land. And I failed miserably. And we really thought about, you know, let's just stay here for a month or so in, in Tokyo and just let things cool down before going home. But in the end, I thought, you know, I came here with this team. We win as a team, we lose as a team. So I, I went home with the team. And right when I, sure enough, right when I got off the plane, ABS-CBN had a camera and a mic stuck in my face. It was TJ Manotok, I can remember very clearly. He said, coach, what happened? And I was so tempted to give all these excuses. You know, we were, there's a draw in these com competitions and we were drawn in the group of death. We were drawn with China, with the eventual champion Iran, which is a really strong, super group. Because of our poor seeding, we were drawn in that group. And then in the I important game, the referee made a bad call. You know, as coaches, when we lose, it's always the referee's fault, right? <laughs> So that was really a couple of really bad calls. And then there was a time when the Philippine Federation was suspended, so we couldn't practice. There was a lot of reasons why we lost. And I really wanted to go through that whole explanation. But in the end, I said, why, why, why bother? And I just saw so when TJ Manotak asked, Coach, what happened? I said, um, it's my responsibility. I take all the blame. We tried our best. We couldn't get it done. It's my fault. And that's it. I left it at that and left. I was the coach, that the team that you saw earlier, San Miguel. That was 2007. I was the coach of San Miguel. When I left for the national team, they put an interim coach. But then when I lost, they said, well, I don't think, they, don't, they didn't think I was the right coach for them. So they made that interim coach permanent, basically fired me from, from, from my old position. So I was out of the job and I was really at the doldrums of my professional coaching career. I mean, if you talk of, if you ask me about what is the worst part of my career, I'll tell you without a doubt, 2007. When I was, when I finally had my dream job, being the head coach of the Philippine national team and to fail the country so miserably was the worst part. It was the worst point in my career, lowest point in my career. But I came home and I took full accountability. I didn't blame anybody else. One month later, my phone rings, MVP is calling, hires me to be his coach. What a, an irony. When I was winning all these championships, he wouldn't get me. When I lost in the biggest coaching job of my career, then he hired me. And so later on, uh, when he hired me, Tokentex had won one championship in 10 years. After he hired me, we won 
four championships in two years, five championships in two years, went to six straight finals, so on and so forth. And so we were celebrating as we always do after wins, Risa, you know this very well. And you know, in those light moments, uh, I, I had the guts to ask him. So I said, boss, you know, through all these years that we've known each other, of course, I was kind of, I was kind of being, uh, I was kind of bragging, being mayabang, saying, see, boss, you should have hired me before. Then you would have more championships than now. But you hired me so late, so on and so forth. But then I said, so finally, what made you hire me? And he said, remember when you lost in the national team? You got interviewed, and you took full accountability and responsibility for that loss. That made you hire No amount of victories or wins in the past would make you hire me. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if we want our team, our team members, to have a high sense of accountability, it must begin with us. We cannot teach accountability. We cannot send them to a conference or a management workshop for account. I don't think there's a, such a thing as an accountability workshop. We can, however, model it. And we can, however, show them by being accountable ourselves. And we have, if we have a, a group of individuals, a team of players who are accountable for their actions, then you have a champion team. Trust, execution, accountability. And the final letter, letter M, is a just with term magis. It's Latin for more. And in the end, I think the best leaders, the best teams, they're not happy with what they have. We're not happy. We, we always want something more. They, they say that the, the mother of motivation is discontent. We're just not happy with what we have. Discontent is different from malcontent. Malcontent is a different thing. But I think discontentment is, is the mother of all motivation. And we want more. We want to have more victories. We want to win in a bigger stage. We, have, we want to be able to develop more leaders. And that's what makes truly great, successful, excellent champion teams. And I would submit that's what makes truly great, excellent, long-lasting leaders. If you're able to deliver more, if you're able to deliver something bigger than what was expected of you, if you're able to make your people better individuals, better players, better employees. That's what we do, dear leaders. Something more. More than the job description. More than the KRAs. More than the KPIs. More than what's traditionally expected of us. And for me now in this situation, the more, the magis is again the Philippine national team. This is my second tour of duty. In 2007, it was a terrible experience. And so when they offered it to me again, we, my wife and I, we had to think long and hard. Would we subject ourselves again to that embarrassment, to that humiliation, to that heartache? It is hard to coach the Philippine national team. For a country that is that 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 looks at basketball as our religion, as our national pastime, but but with a government that puts in so little, puts in so little uh, support towards it, it's hard. You go to countries, you go to competition, ill prepared, but everyone expects you to win. It's hard. So we had a long, hard talk about it, and I really thought. But in the end, I felt that I took a look at my professional coaching career. I retired last year after 20 years coaching in the PBA. And I said, I have the Coach of the Year awards, I have the titles, I have all this and that. But there's got to be something more. And the one thing that is so, I'm getting goosebumps telling you, the one thing that is so clear in my mind is in 2014 in the World Championships in Spain, to have the Philippine flag there. So I was given that, uh, 
that uh, task last year. So they gave me again the, the, the national team coaching chores. And you have to understand, at that point, I was coming from, we were coming from six straight finals. I just won my fifth champ. I mean, I had built a team, a talk and text team that was not going to lose anymore. It was just so, they knew each other so well. They were this great chemistry. I mean, the other teams couldn't even touch us. In an era of great parity in the PBA, for a team to go to six straight finals was unheard of. I gave that all up to get into this headache again, which is the national team. So in July last year, we put the national team together. We got our choices. We said, you know, we want all these, our top players. James Yap, Arwin Santos, Jim, all of these top players we named to the pool. But if you wanted to be part of the team, you had to sign a commitment letter. A commitment letter was very, very specific. If I join the national team pool, I will give up for the next three years. I will not rest in the off-season. I will give up my vacation. I will give up time. It's actually specified. I will give up time with my family. And I will do so without even an assurance that I will make the final team. So it was a very tough commitment letter. So we had our first practice. Guess what? James Yap didn't show up. Arwin Santos didn't show up. All these big names, they didn't show up. So we have our depth chart. Well, James Yap doesn't want, so we get to the next guy. Uh, Jeff Chan. Mark Kagiwa doesn't show up, we go to the next guy. Larry Fonacher. Arwin Santos doesn't want, we go to the next guy. J.R. Reyes. It's a depth chart. For me, it was more important to get the players who were not the best, but who wanted to be there. So we put a team together, practiced a couple of weeks, and then we went to the Jones Cup tournament in, in Taipei. The Jones Cup is a huge tournament. It's not only for Asia, but there is also a U.S. team, and there's also an Australian team. But going there, the media was already crucifying us, said, this, this is a Bullock team, they said. Anong klase ng Philippine team yan? For the first time in, well, I don't know, ever, I guess, we had a Philippine national team that didn't have an MVP. Think of the MVPs of the PBA the past 10 years. Last year was Kagiwa. Before that was Alapag. Before that was James Yap, back to back. Before that was Kelly Williams. It was Asitao Lava, Willie Miller, Kirby Raimundo. All of the PBA MVPs, not one of them was in this team. For whatever reason, some, their, pe their, their mother team didn't allow them, some were injured, some didn't want, were tired, whatever reason, for the first time in history, we had a Philippine national team that did not have a single MVP. It's like having the US team that doesn't have Kobe Bryant, doesn't have LeBron James, that doesn't have, you know, Chris Paul, all the, all the MVPs or Derek Cruz, it's unthinkable, but that's what we had. But what I had was a group of committed players, players who wanted to be there, who were proud to wear the Philippine flag on their chest. So we went to the tournament, we played, got lucky, won a couple of games, lost one, and then we went on a hot streak until the final game comes, and here we are faced with Team USA for the gold medal. Can you believe this ragtag team? We were the shortest team in the league. We were the team without a MVP. And here we're facing the mighty U.S. This is not the U.S. team, of course, of LeBron James and Kobe. I don't know if we can beat that team or even be in the same court with them. But this is in the NBA. There is what they call the D-League, the, uh, the, the developmental league. So this is a team with a couple of seven-footers, couple of six-eight guys, uh, six-nine, couple of very, really good team. And so... We battled them. I gave a very, I mean, in fairness, <laughs> in fairness, I thought I gave a very rousing pregame speech, motivated. I said, guys, the first time in your lives you will play a U.S. team for the gold medal in basketball. Imagine that. Maybe in the future you'll play a U.S. team. Maybe in the future you'll pay for a gold. But I doubt you'll ever play Team USA for a gold medal in basketball. So go out and do your best. We can do this. Go. So the players were fired up, they burst through the doors, we started the game, and within five minutes the score was 
12-2 or something. I mean, they were get we were getting our butts kicked. So I call a timeout. And so I say, guys, ano ba? I mean, this is this is all this is we're gonna just go away and, and get beat by this team. No coach, we can do it. Yeah, okay, let's go fight. Puso, that's what we're calling. Go back out on the court. 22 6. <laughs> I mean, I mean, this team was just kicking our butts. We had no chance. We shouldn't even be in the same court with them. But what I find, if you have a team of committed players, commit, if you have a team of individuals who really want to be there, they never quit. They just, they just won't quit. For some reason, they'll find it in their hearts. Ano tawag natin yun? May pinagdudukutan. They find it, they find that place so deep inside them, and they just draw something out as if out of nowhere. So we kept battling and battling, and now we're just going to fast show you the f last few minutes. This is now the last quarter. We're down by eight points. Last quarter of the gold medal game, if we can just play. Finally, Lucky break. Filipino. Lucky break for us there. And, uh, he had the inside position of that offensive rebound. Tenorio came on strong late in the third quarter. Can he continue here? Pull up jumper. Yes, he's better. It's good. Here comes the USA. Good chance of defense. Tenorio, or Punisher takes it away. Tenorio with a slap. Tenorio, nagantay mo na na rest back. Will pull up for a three. Oh, oh by LA. LA Tenorio carrying the Philippines on his shoulders right now. Pulls up for a three. No, doubt it with a rebound. LA na naman ang didiscarte para dito sa Gilas. Pasa niya na to pick. Punisher picks it up. Larry to the corner. Game for three. Yes! Tabla na ang ating lawanan. 59-0. Tenorio contra Justice. Bibigyan ng pick ni Dautit. LA with some separation. LA on the run. Yes! L.A. Tenorio, smallest guy on the floor for Team Philippines, but sure done. Norwood. Yeah, 36 seconds left, game on Arnold. the line. Norwood maglalabas ng bola. L.A. ang tatanggap, exactly how coach shot through it. Jeff Chan, tumanggap. Execution. Jeff, back to L.A. Ngayon, kailangan ng tumiskarte ni Teniente. Doubt it, will offer the pick. L.A. has 12 seconds to work with. Tenorio with an 18-footer. Yes! Yes! Big shot by L.A. Tenorio. And right now, we only need a stop. Tuloy-tuloy na tayo dito. Up! Hindi na tumayo mata USA. No fouls to give for Gilas. Gary David looking for the stop. No! L.A. Tenorio with a rebound. And L.A. Tenorio is fouled. That is a foul to give for the USA. Gilas Filipinas will end down with 8 seconds remaining. And L.A. Tenorio, monster ball game. Here you go. The USA looking for the miracle. Pinokol yung bola. Puts it up. No! Oh. Gilas Filipinas will bring home the Jones Cup for only the fourth time in the 34-year year history of this to tournament. And what a way to... Finally, Filipino. That is my more. That is my more to have a team of really just a ragtag team. Not any of our best players. None of our MVPs was even there. And to beat a team like the USA. That's what we're now trying to duplicate for this August. So now I'm faced with that task. Faced to leading. I'm faced with the task of leading the Philippines against the best teams in Asia. And to win a bronze medal to win at least a bronze medal so that we can play in the World Championships in Spain next year. The last time we played in the World Championships was 40 years ago. 1974. Can you imagine? Can anyone tell me why we played in the World Championships in 1974? Huh? Yeah, because we hosted it. It was held here. <laughs> we hosted it so we were seeded by default. <laughs> But it's really a monumental task. Why am I doing it? I feel, I've always said, I'm not, I'm not a CEO like you guys. I don't employ hundreds or thousands of people. I don't have a business that generates millions of dollars in profit to help the economy. 
All I am is a basketball coach. This is what I do. Because I find if we're doing this, that we're able to inspire and rally a nation because we love basketball so much. I do it for those people there in Taipei. Those are our OFW, our countrymen. They get on a bus three hours, four hours away and watch it. And when we see how happy they are when we, when we win, that makes it all worthwhile. That's my more. That's my magis. That's why I, I, I want to do these things. Ladies and gentlemen in this room, what is your more? What is your more for you? What is it? It's got to be something more than just our jobs today. It's got to be more than our title. It's got to be more than our compensation. It's got to be more than the perks. It's got to be more than just the business. How do you build teams? Build trust levels. Commit to execution. Be adaptable and find the magis. That's something more. Like I said, this is not from any book or any course or any lecture. It's just from my actual experience. And who would have thought from the time that I was first fired from my first job coaching Pure Foods in 1997, in, I, I think I set a record in, one, in nine months for being fired from two jobs from two teams. Pure Foods fired me, went to Santa Lucia, Santa Lucia fired me again. From that point to being up here speaking in front of you guys, who would have thought, man, you really never know about this life. But we just do our best, we get up every day, we throw our lives into our work. Like they say, you can never can tell. Uh, that's all I have, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for listening. You all have a good morning. Very good, very impressive. Please stay. We have a few questions here. But one thing, I don't know if anybody knows, but I, I did not, the first time ever, I did not wear a tie in honor of our speaker today. And I noticed many of you didn't. There's a few guys, so please, I don't mean to embarrass anybody. Take them off if you feel like it. But in any case, uh, a good story. One thing, uh, I'll, I'll, we got time for, for some questions, but I, I did pull up the, the Wikipedia rankings, international rankings for Philippines, and, and we noticed that you know Philippines wasn't you know close to the top, and, and I was wondering, what, what do you think about that? What's, our, what's the country's chances uh, coming up in August? Oh, our chances. I really think, honestly, we're ranked maybe fifth, sixth in a tie with Korea. The top two teams are China and, and Iran, and then there's Lebanon, then there's Jordan, and the next level is us, the Philippines, and Korea should be in the next. So um, I really have, I'm really very optimistic about our chances because it's going to be held here. We're going to have the hometown support and the audience. I, I, we're hoping the fans really come out. But I think this is our most prepared team as well. Aside from that tournament we started last July, training, granted we haven't been training every day, but at least there's something that we started. So the combination of the preparation, uh, playing in front of our home crowd, and of course having a good coach, I think is, uh, <laughs> is gonna, is I think the combination of preparation and playing at home, I think is going to help us win, yeah. Okay, very good. Oh, come on, some questions. Please, yeah, come on up. Hi, Coach. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pons from uh, Nestle. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Pons. Um, just a question. You know, your industry is interesting because um, it's a zero-sum game. Yeah. You know? A winner happens because there's a loser. Yep. In, in our industry, it's, it's a bit different because if I compete against a company, he grows 10%, I grow 10%, you know, we're both happy. Yep. Um, what principles do you follow um, in losing? Because you know? the thing with what you've shown, it, it's spectacular wins, no? great stories. But an interesting thing to learn from you is how do you manage losing? How do you manage yourself? How do you manage your team? Uh, I'd be interested to find about that. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I have a very always, uh, I guess because I've, got, I've had so much practice in losing, uh, I know how to lose so well. <laughs> um, first of all, I'm the world's first worst loser. And the minute any loss is okay with me, that's the time sign for me to hang it up. But number one, for me, when I lose, is acknowledgement. 
I got to I've got to acknowledge uh, that I lost that I'm really pissed about it so for me it's it's uh, an acknowledgement and an awareness to find out why I lost because if you continue blaming and pointing fingers at so many other different things that's not going to get you anywhere so first it's a, it's a, a acknowledgement acknowledge your role and what you could have done better because with the acknowledgement and the awareness comes the ability to now step back and be objective and then take a look at your performance in basketball in sports it's easy we just watch the video and, and my wife can attest I'm the it's it's hell when we lose because we after we if a game ends at 10 30 we'll have dinner get home at 11 30 then I'm gonna watch the game the loss and she says I don't know how you can do that what's wrong with you how can you watch uh, you know how to can you subject yourself to that process but I have to do it I have to do it I have to face the music so to speak to f be able to objectively figure out why we lost and you know when we do our clinics with the, with the kids we used to do a lot of basketball clinics for seven eight year olds and we all this when when they lose the game they will always cry so i always tell them lose the game but never lose the lesson okay so that's very important to me so it, it applies to eight year olds and i think it applies to me as well lose the game but never lose the lesson the first step is acknowledgement and your ability to step back and and view what happened very objectively and then next thing you have to do is you got to commit to uh, a plan of addressing what went wrong so that's that's very important and then the final thing and for me the most important thing is to dive right back to it just go do it again because the worst thing is you get is you develop cold feet or you become you 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 become you know you're, you get a fro what we call a frozen trigger you, you just don't want to shoot again because you've missed so much so that's that's the important thing for me acknowledgement and awareness stepping back to be more objective developing a a plan to address uh, what you've seen what the, the the faults were and then most importantly go right back into it I hope it answered your question thank you okay come on up <coughs> Morning, coach. Morning, Richard. Morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to follow up on the uh, <clears throat> question of the, the gentleman earlier. How do you react in front of your team when you lose? Do you cry? <laughs> do you rant? Do you scream? All yeah. of the above. <laughs> <laughs> if so, if, if, if your uh, reply is uh, exactly your reaction, do you think this is a good way to motivate your team when you are losing? Now, it's so easy to motivate our team when we, when we are on top, when yes. we are successful. But is this uh, a good way to motivate our team when we are losing? Yes. Well, thank you. Great question. Um, I just go back to my original premise. When I say as leaders, we have to be vulnerable. We have to be real to our to our people to our players and part of being real is just the, the emotion what are we feeling at that point and sometimes yeah sometimes i'll just rant and rave i'll throw things i've broken this knuckle it's it's so swollen because of the many times i've hit the wall at the arneta coliseum just punching cussing cussing somebody out and really being wild after a loss there are times after a loss, I'm just so upset, I couldn't say anything, I'll just walk out of the dugout. We'll say our prayer and I'll say, okay, I'll just see you tomorrow. And th there are times when I'll actu I've actually, especially we lost a pretty close championship, but I actually broke down uh, and, and, and cried with my, with my players. Um, it, it's hard, it, it's, it's an emotion. But to answer your question, is this a good way to motivate? I think being real with your people is the best way to motivate. Being real with your people is the best way to motivate. When your people see that you're a human just, as de just like them, I think that's very important. My number one rule for motivating people is first be self-motivated yourself. And I'll be redundant. I will say first be self-motivated yourself first. And I believe we cannot fool our people. They smell us a mile away. So um, for me, 
uh, I make sure that as a coach, as a leader, I'm very self-motivated coming in. Because if you're not self-motivated, you can say all the right words. You can deliver all the rara speeches. You can dangle all the incentives. But we cannot fool our people. They can smell us a mile away. That's why when I work with restaurant managers of McDonald's, I tell them, boss, as you're entering the, the store in the morning, you haven't said a word yet, but your people are always watching. They can be wiping a counter here, tossing fries. They may not be looking, but they're always watching. They're checking you out. Ano ba si ma'am? Naku, nakataas na naman ang kilay. Si boss, nakakunot na naman ang noo. I said, you know, our people are watching us. They're checking. They're looking at your facial expression. Do you have, do, is there a frown on your face? Ano bang nakataas na kilay sa Tagalog? Is your, uh, whatever. <laughs> so, raised eyebrows so so our people are always watching us even before we utter our first words in the morning so they're checking they get their energy their motivation from us so to answer your question after a loss i'm not worried about motivating my people at that point at that point i'm there my 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 job as a leader at the very point when we suffer a loss is i have to be present with them that I don't leave them, that I don't abandon them. I hate it when I see coaches, when their team wins. You see this in UAP games. When their team wins, they're there singing the song and cheering with their players. But when their team loses, you can't find them. They're gone. Our first job as leaders when our team loses is we've got to be there with them. That's the most important thing is our presence. And then later on, what I find most motivating is having had the time in our job it's the next day so if i done my job that night i watched the film and now i show them the film the next day and now i'm very objective this is why we lost so it can be something that's subjective but i have video proof well we lost uh jimmy because for some reason your man kept beating you i don't know if you were lazy or what but your man kept beating you here's the film it, they cannot dispute it okay so after that then i say okay so here's our plan now we have a next game here's the plan i think i find that more motivating than any rara speech i think when they know when your players know that you're there with them not only in the victories but, but most importantly in the losses when you're there with them i think that's important and then the next, when your players see the next day in practice, you're prepared. You came from a crushing, absolutely crushing loss last night. But here you are at 9 a.m., you've got a game plan ready, the video is set, everything is prepared. Your players, after they lost, they'll sleep. The coach, after the loss, he's punishing himself, watching the video. Why? Because next day, I gotta show something to my players. Here is why we lost. And this is what we're going to do. We go to practice the next day. The thing about building trust levels is it obviates finger pointing. Building, if you have a very strong sense of trust in your organization, there is no need for finger pointing or finding blame. Because you trust everybody gave his best. That's why in our team we have, no, we have a rule. Don't say sorry. If I have a partner in golf, he misses a putt, makes a bad shot, he says, sorry, partner. No, no, sorry. Just say sorry if you didn't try your best. So in our rule, sometimes players will, they make a mistake, they say, coach, sorry, man. I said, no, just go back, play, 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 play basketball. We got a strong sense of trust and accountability that, that, that we, we, we know that everyone is in that position. So for me, after a loss, I find the, that's the most motivating thing is to be there and sometimes I can yell I'm not saying you cannot yell at people and God knows I'm the world's worst yeller and remember Ali Peak you know if we had more time I'd go through the whole Ali Peak story but very early when they first started coaching Ali I actually threw him out of practice I said Ali what the f are you doing get the hell out of my practice I mean just 
abused him. And you see how big he is? My assistant coach had to say, Coach, easy. If he goes, out, if he goes after you, we can't protect you. He's so big. But then, a few, uh, years after, we had uh, a party. Uh, it was a family affair. And because uh, some of my uh, uh, relatives became, uh, okay, there was a girl that we wanted him to date, Ali Peak. So we set him up in, in that party. And my cousin asked him straight, Ali, because we just played the game the next day, Ali, coach was yelling at you. How, how do you take that? And Ali Peak said, Coach yells us at uh, us. Coach yells at us all the time. That's why we win. That's why we win. I'm not saying yelling is good. I'm not saying cussing out is good. I'm saying I have a strong enough relationship and trust level with my people that I can be really, really hard on them. I've actually done a what used to be a uh, mortal sin in coaching. After a game that we lost, I called my player out in front of media. They asked, Coach, why did you lose? Well, Jimmy Alapag, our captain, just was terrible tonight. If he can't make a shot, we can't win this game. But you know, the next game, played well. We won the championship. In the press gun after the championship, the, the, the reporter asked him, Jimmy, your coach threw you under the bus after that loss. What can you say? He said, well, he was right. I wasn't playing well. That's my responsibility. But guys, I'm not giving you permission to do that. What I'm saying is, if you have a strong enough relationship and build strong trust levels with your people, there's a lot of things that they'll, they'll take a lot from you. But the basic and the foundation is trust. So that you know if I, because it's basketball, it's going up and down the court. My players know that I can say, Hey, Richard, you know, that, that thing you did, it's pretty good, but maybe next time, don't pass it there, maybe pass it the other. By that time, you know, the other team has scored three. I have no time to do that. So sometimes I'm just going to say, Richard, what the hell are you doing? Get your ass down on the, whatever. So you can be hard. It, it can be whatever your style is, but you have to create strong trust levels with your people. I hope I answered you in that very long-winded manner. I'm sorry. Very motivational. Maybe any more? <laughs> oh, I guess maybe we should get on. Yeah. Extremely good. What a speaker. Right, let's have another hand. <laughs> very good. I think this is one of the best speakers, I think. Motivational, certainly. Please stay. We've got some gift giving and so forth. I'll introduce Rebecca Bustamante, President of Agency of Foreign. Thanks, Richard. Being a great speaker, a great leader, a great coach, a lot of people would like to give you gift. <laughs> it's Christmas time for him. Wow, yeah. yeah.